obeyed by faith. He went out by faith. He didn't know where he was going, but he knew that God had told him, okay, Abraham, I want you to pack up, and I want you to start walking. I know you're going out in the wilderness. And you know, when he, when he asked Abraham to leave, they lived in a comfortable city. Abraham was a wealthy man. He had a comfortable home. I mean, for him to say, okay, pack up your camels, and that's why I like this artist's depiction. I mean, there, there wasn't just him and his wife and a few kids. They had a whole entourage of people who went with them. I mean, can you imagine some of the questions he might have had in his mind, like, how are we, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? Where are we going to pitch our tents? Come on, we're going to leave the, the house. We got a good, solid foundation home here. And what are we going to do when bad weather hits? Wouldn't those be some common things that would come into your mind? You would be thinking, it's not going to be easy. We're just going to start camping, full-time camping, with all these people that are going to go with us by faith. It didn't say he went out by logic. It didn't make sense. It didn't say he went out by feeling because it didn't feel like the right. It didn't say that he went out because everybody else was going to say, oh, yeah, you're such a lucky guy. No, people were not saying that. They were probably saying, what in the world are you thinking? Where are you, what are you doing? By faith, Abraham obeyed, not knowing where he was going. Now, think about that. You don't really, you don't even know. You don't even know what, what tomorrow is going to bring. Think of the uncertainties that must have been in Abraham and his family members' minds as they started going by faith. You see, in the short term, Abraham had no idea where he was going. Abraham, in the short term, Abraham didn't know what tomorrow was going to bring, what next week was going to bring, what next month was going to bring. But I guarantee you one thing they did know. They did know that it was not going to be easy. They did know they were going to meet with tribulation. They did know they were going to run into hardships and trials. But that didn't hold them back. They went out by faith, despite all the things that they knew in the short term was going to be, be tough. Not knowing where he was going, but Abraham did know one thing. I want you to look at what Abraham did know, verses 9 through 10. By faith. He dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited, no, no, this is where it is. This is what Abraham knew. He didn't know where he was going on the short term, but he knew where he was going long term. Long term, did Abraham know where he was going? Yes. Short term, did he know where he was going? No. Long term, verse 10, he waited for the city whose builder and maker was who? God. He says, God, I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. I don't know where you're going to lead me. I just know there's going to be tribulation and trouble ahead. But I know in the end, it's going to be good. In the end, you're taking me home. I know in the end, you're leading me to the city that you have prepared for me. An eternal home for me and my family. That's where he knew it was going to end up. Communion is another opportunity for us today to realize we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, do we? We don't know what next week or next month is going to bring. What we do know in the short term, though, is that we're going to be faced with tribulation. There's going to be trials. It's not going to be easy. Just like Abraham, when God said, Abraham, leave your city dwelling, start walking in the desert. I'm going to lead you home. It didn't make sense. He started walking. They had troubles. You can read the stories of Abraham and all the things that they encountered. In fact, he even died before he got to the city. But for us today, look what it says. In the world, you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Short term, it's not going to be easy for us, is it? Tribulation. And we don't know what tomorrow, what the next day is going to bring. We do know there's going to be challenges. Some of you may be going through those challenges today. But you continue to go forward by faith. 
Do you know where you're ultimately going? Do you know where you're ultimately being led by God to? That's the purpose of communion. Do you know that there's something much better that God is going to lead you to if you continue to trust him in the short term, which you don't understand sometimes, trust him in the short term, knowing that there's a long term ending that makes it all worthwhile. Like in Abraham's case. And that long-term ending is what? A city whose builder and maker was God, an eternal home that Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you and I'm going to come back for you and I'm going to take you there. But in the short term, look what it says in the short term again. John Acts 14, 22. Continue in the faith, for we must through many tribulations enter into the kingdom of God. As we continue to trust God in the short term, like Abraham didn't know where he was going, we're doing the very same thing. Is it going to be a rosy path? Is it going to be sun drenched? You know, everything just going to be fine with the, the moon and the... No, it's going to be storms. It's going to be tough. But we go forward by faith, not by feeling. We go forward by faith, not by reason. We go forward by faith, not by the encouragement of what others are telling us because so many other people are saying, you're crazy for doing that. But we're going forward by faith because we know what God has revealed to us about his will. And we obey by faith. Speaking of not knowing where you're going, Albert Einstein one day, one of the smartest men in the world, at least he gets credit for being one of the smartest men in the world, was on a train one day. And as he was on the train, the conductor, you know, back in those days, the conductors would come up and down the aisle and they would have a little punch thing and they'd say, tickets, let me see your tickets. And everybody would give the tickets and he'd punch the ticket. And the conductor finally comes up to where Albert Einstein is sitting and he's going through his pockets trying to, like he's looking for something. And the conductor, when he gets there, sees Albert Einstein looking for his ticket. And the conductor says, it's okay, Mr. Einstein, I know who you are. I know you ride this train all the time. I'm sure you purchased your ticket. Don't worry, it's okay. And Albert Einstein said, thank you, young man. And the, the conductor goes on down the aisle and a little bit later he finishes his round and, he, and he's heading back and as he's going through the car where Albert Einstein had been seated, seated he, uh, he notices that there's, Albert Einstein's not in his seat. And he's going to wonder where he was. He didn't, I didn't pass him on the way up. He must have went to the back of the train. There's nothing in the back of the train. I wonder where he is. And as he got up to where Albert Einstein was seated, he looks and there he is on his hands and knees crawling underneath the seats of the train looking for his ticket. And the conductor says to Albert Einstein, young Albert, I, I know it's okay. I told you, uh, you don't, I, I don't, I trust you, you don't need to, to punch your ticket. Albert Einstein, one of the smartest men in the world, said this. I know, young man, you know who I am, but I've got to find my ticket because I don't know where I'm getting off. I don't know where I'm going. He had to find the ticket in order to know where he was going. Listen, that's one of the purposes of communion. Do you know where you're going? Do you know what the ultimate end is? I know none of us know what tomorrow's going to bring or what the short term is going to bring other than tribulation and trial. But do you know what the ultimate end is? The ticket is Jesus. And if you have the ticket, you know where the end destination is going to be no matter what tomorrow is going to bring, no matter what the tribulations are going to, to befall us. As Scripture said, before you get to the end, end destination, what did Jesus say you would experience? Here it is again. In the world you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Why? Because Jesus has already overcome every tribulation that you and I have to face. Jesus has already encountered. Jesus has already overcome. He is the victor, and he says, because I am victorious, I will make you victorious too. But just as I had to go through tribulation to get to the final destination, you will too. Difference is, Jesus says, I'll be with you. I will not forsake you. I will make you overcomers. You may think, you know, the devil just is after me. He's just dogging my steps. He's on my every, everywhere I turn. I just can't seem to have any moment of peace. Listen, we feel that way sometimes. And sometimes I'm sure it's true. But none of us have had to experience tribulation like Jesus. None of us have had the, the, the undivided attention of Lucifer himself 
and all the hellish angels like Jesus. Which is why Jesus says, be of good cheer, I have overcome. You will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. But it doesn't feel good sometimes. I mean, when you're, in, when you're there, when you're in the midst of it, you don't understand why, and the things happen in the short term, and you don't know what the next week's going to bring in. That's why communion is so important. So that whatever we go through, we can have an assurance and a certainty to know there's an eternal home that I'm going to trust God to lead me to. And communion is another opportunity for every one of us today to accept the ticket and to make sure we have it again, to receive it brand new, and to know, thank you, God, thank you for the assurance that you are going to take me home when you come. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things are written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have what? Eternal life. You have the, assert, the, the assurance of that city whose builder and maker is God. Just like Abraham when they was called out of the Ur of the city, the uh, Ur of the Chaldees. Just like Jesus when he left the comfortable city of the New Jerusalem. He had it, all, he had it made in the comforts of the New Jerusalem. He could have stayed there, but he, he didn't. You know why? Because he wanted you and me more than anything else. He wouldn't be happy unless he had provided an opportunity for you and me to be there with him. So when we take the emblem of his broken body today, when we take that little piece of bread, what we're saying is, I know what this means. I know what this represents. This means that the creator God, the one who spoke and the universe came into existence, the one who got in the dirt and formed Adam and Eve out of the dust of the earth and breathed life into his nostrils, the, the creator God, he came in the form of a human being, in a human body, with all the hurts and all the griefs and all the sorrows and all the pains and all the struggles that you and I have to endure and feel. Jesus felt it. He came in a human body and he lived despite the fact that he was tempted in every way like you and I are tempted, yet without sin. He lived a perfect, sinless, righteous life for me. Perfect, sinless, righteous life for you. Despite all the pain and all the sorrow that he went through in the short term, because he knew there was a long-term goal, an eternal city that he had to make available for you and for me. And when I take that little piece of bread, I'm saying, I choose to accept what Jesus offers me. I choose to accept his righteousness his perfect life. I'm a miserable failure. I could never hope to achieve it. But Jesus achieved it for me. And by faith, I choose to accept what he gives. And he puts his robe of righteousness upon me as I choose to receive him by faith. Just like Abraham by faith when he left on his way to the city. Communion is another opportunity for us to again today. By faith, we accept the broken body of Jesus and all that that entails for us. Look what it says in Hebrews 12, 3, 4. Consider him, consider Jesus who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. You know why we will have a tendency to become weary and discouraged in our soul? Because life is not easy. Because the path that we're walking Trusting by faith on the way to heaven is wrought with tribulation. And the only way to do it is by faith. And the only way to not become discouraged and weary on the paths that we're walking in this world is to keep our eyes on Jesus. Consider him, lest you become weary and discouraged. Do you see the importance of taking that little piece of bread, what that symbolizes? I am choosing to accept what you did for me, your perfect life. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you did. And I will accept you today. But there's more. 
Not only do we accept the bread, we accept the little cup that symbolizes the blood of Jesus that was shared, shed for our sins at the cross. When we take the little, little cup of grape juice, Scriptures calls it wine, unfermented wine, the grape juice. When we take that little cup, what we're doing is we're saying, I know what this means. This means that Jesus not only did he live the perfect life for me in his body, he died the perfect substitutionary death for me, and this cup represents his blood that was poured out, his life that was given freely for me at the cross. And as I take and I drink this cup, I'm saying, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Wash me and cleanse me again in the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Lord, for the assurance that if I am trusting in you, you make me a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. And I can have that brand new experience due to the blood of Jesus. He lived the perfect life. He died the perfect death all in my place so that I can have an opportunity to, to make it to the final destination, the eternal home. Because everything in this world is temporary. It's the eternal home that matters. Abraham had to know what it was that he was, he was going to that enabled him to keep trusting in the short term. And so too do you and I as we keep trusting Jesus in the short term. So when we take the wine, we're committing our lives to Jesus. We're trusting him with our life. We're trusting him with our plans. We're trusting him. We're saying, you're in control of me now. And look what it says here in Hebrews 12, 2. We're to look unto Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. What was the joy that was set before Jesus that enabled him to endure the cross, enabled him to go through that suffering and that shame? What was the joy that got him to go through that terrible time of tribulation, the joy that was set before him. What would that be? What would the joy that was set before him, what would be the joy that was yet to come? The joy that he was not experiencing it while he was dying on the cross. It didn't feel good then, but he knew there was an end destination, a final joy that would someday become reality, and that enabled Jesus to keep trusting. What would that joy be? It would be the day that you and me and Abraham and his whole entourage finally walk in through the gates to that city whose builder and maker was God. That was the joy. Jesus knew the end destination. Abraham knew the end destination. They didn't know how, how things were going to play out in the short term, but they did know it would be hard. But they knew that the end destination would be worth it. Do you know where you're going? Do you know what your end destination will be? None of us know what the short term is going to be other than tribulation. But we can know we're going to go home. Communion is a stark reminder of that reality for every one of us again today. Just like Abraham and his entourage going off, wandering and camping in the wilderness, they died in that wilderness, but they will someday make it home, won't they? What about us? Where are we going? Do we have that assurance? Are we walking by faith? Are we, are we trusting in what God said? Or are we looking at the, the discouragements of, along the path before we get there? Jesus said, you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I'm a, I've overcome. I'll make you an overcomer. He's going to come back soon. We're going to go home. As we get closer to the second coming of Jesus, I would think that communion service should become more and more of a, of a Sabbath where the whole church should come out for communion. Not one of the least attended Sabbaths of the quarter, but the most attended Sabbath of the quarter so that Jesus can attend, keep us in that right relation as he's preparing us all for his soon coming. Well, there's something that we do. We take very seriously what Jesus said when he said in John chapter 13 that if I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you should do this to one another. And so we do that at the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Jesus said we should before we take the communion. If you would like to participate in this foot washing service, there are rooms in the back, one for the men, 
one for the women and one for married couples could serve one another. There's towels and water and basins and split up into, into groups of two. So if you would rather not, though, that's, it's up to you. Where no one's going to try to twist your arm, make you feel bad. If you would rather remain seated quietly here in the sanctuary in an attitude of prayer until we come back for the communion service, you're welcome to do that. If you'd like to come and observe a foot washing service, maybe you've never seen one before, you're welcome to come and observe. But again, we'd like to invite you to participate too if you would like to do that. Now, when we do come back, John, you want us to try to sit every other pew, make it easier for the deacons? What's that? Oh, the, okay, they have, they have a little mark on them. Does anyone, you want them to sit in the ones that are marked, right? So you'll see that when we come back. Very good. Um, and one other thing I want you to understand, too. If you are not a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you are more than welcome to participate. We celebrate what we call open communion in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which means, simply means this. You don't have to be a member. All we ask is that you understand what it means. When you take the bread, when you take the juice, we just ask that you understand that it means you're saying, Jesus, would you come into my life again today? Jesus, would you forgive me of my sins today? If that's the desire of your heart, then by all means, celebrate open communion with us today. Come back to the foot of the cross. Come and accept. Maybe you need to accept Jesus for the very first time. I don't know, but come. The invitation is still going out. Every time we take communion, the invitation is still going out. Come and accept by faith and know what the final end destination is going to be. You accept that by faith as well. Before we break up, let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for all that Jesus has done. The realities that you bring to pass the spiritual realities that we accept by faith when we receive these emblems and we know that you did something in a human body, living a perfect righteous life, we choose to accept that. Dying a perfect death with your blood, we choose to accept and rely on your blood for the washing and cleansing again. Please fill us all in a new way today, Lord, as we participate. Thank you for meeting here with us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, we'll break up now for the foot wash. Any other instructions, John? with us in prayer while the elders kneel. Roger's going to ask God's blessing on the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of partaking of this symbol of your body that has been sacrificed for us. And may we never forget what sin cost heaven. And may we never forget the infinite value of the sacrifice of Jesus who died for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Apostle Paul continued writing In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you bow your heads with us one more time while the elders kneel? Mark will ask God's blessing on the wine. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you provided a way by the shed blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. And we pray that you'll Bless this opportunity that we could partake of the symbol of this blood in drinking this grape juice. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Gethsemane. It says they sang a hymn together and they departed. So that's the way we usually end our communion services. We sing a hymn and that marks the end of the service and we depart. You know, when Jesus and the disciples did that first communion service, when they departed, they were going to the Garden of Gethsemane and then onto the cross. Who knows what we're going to be going into when we leave this service? Scripture says you will have tribulation. We don't know, but we do know 
If you've accepted these emblems and received Jesus anew by faith today, you do know that no matter what tomorrow brings, you know where it's ultimately going to end up someday. Just like Abraham, just like Jesus was able to endure the cross, you and I will be able to endure whatever tomorrow brings, knowing that Jesus is with us, he has overcome already, he makes us overcomers, and he is someday going to take us home and we will drink fresh juice like this in the heavenly kingdom at the marriage supper of the Lamb when he comes. Let's stand, let's sing this song together. One chorus, we'll do it a cappella, of course, but it's a distinct Adventist hymn. So go ahead and stand and let's sing this little chorus as we depart. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, ye pilgrims, be joyful and sing. A love offering taken at the back. If any of you would like to contribute to the love offering, it goes to help people in times of need. <laughs>